Mutual presents Arch Obler's Plays. The Mutual Broadcasting System has the pleasure of presenting the third broadcast of a special 26-week series of plays by radio playwright Arch Obler. In this series, we hope to bring you dramas full of the excitement and the meaning of plays told in relation to the expanding world in which we live. The play will be introduced by Arch Obler. Everyone is talking about the post-war home. Houses that will be bought in packages and erected while you wait with a tack hammer and a button hook. They talk about vacuum glass walls and radiant heating and coal lighting and organic living and kitchen sinks, which will include everything but the kitchen sink. I read these notes about the brave new house, and then I heard a song. And by that peculiar reverse alchemy of a playwright's mind, I've written a play, which my friend Raymond Massey will now bring you, which is about the house I live in, but which has nothing to do with plastics or packaged conveniences, but which has to do with a man's heart. <laughs> tell you about the house I live in. I want to tell you how the house that had been mine lost its walls and all the rooms were filled with rubble and the dust arose. And when I looked again, the house was gone. Was it a bomb that fell? Bomb? Bomber over Elm Street, USA. But you no. say your house disappeared. How did it disappear? I'm going to tell you. The morning began as so many others have begun since. Tom and Elsa had gone. Again, I hadn't slept. I opened the front door, stood on the front porch, and watched the daylight slowly wake up the street. It had rained during the night. I had listened to every drop. And now the light lit up the wet leaves as the trees shook themselves in the morning wind. Another day, and I was waiting for eight o'clock. <laughs> Sorry, Mr. Rogers, nothing today. You sure? Perhaps the letter... Sorry, Mr. Rogers, nothing today. Maybe it'll come tomorrow. I already knew about tomorrow. Sorry, Mr. Rogers, nothing today. You know, it takes a long time for a letter to get to Elm Street from Japan. I went back into the house. Chairs, tables, sofa, the piano Elsa had played. The piano Elsa had played. I went upstairs. Tom's room, just as it had been. His bed, his typewriter on the desk, his track shoes hanging from the side of that chair he had made in manual training. Just the way it had been that last night. Sure, Dad. Sure, all packed. Uh, come on in. Sit down. Socks? What do I want to take more socks for? But, Dad, didn't you ever hear of GI issue? Say, Dad, will you do something for me? All this junk here, will you hand it out to those Margolis kids down the street? Yeah. Yeah, the baseball and the mitt. <laughs> Remember when I broke my thumb on that hot liner? Oh, you better not give them the football until fall, because if you give it to them now, there won't be much of it left by then. Hey, Dad, did you hear about that? I'm getting farsighted. Dad, my track shoes, everything but my track shoes. I'll be doing a little running when I get back, if I'm still young enough. Me and my long gray beard doing the high hurdles. Oh, 
Come on, Dad. It isn't as bad. Well, look, I'll be back soon. Don't you read the papers? Why, well, this war with the Japolas won't last six months once I get over there. Dad, well, this is just a guess, but I got a hunch we'll be starting the bomb Tokyo soon. Well, it's just a hunch, but if it happens, I'm going to be in on it, and, well, I'll, I'll send you a bird's-eye picture of the Emperor's oh, horse. <laughs> Dad, something else. And we... We almost got married last week, and then we didn't. Yeah. Oh, no, it was me. I, well, I wanted her to have a chance to change her mind if I didn't get... If I stayed away too long. She found out that absence didn't make the hard... Well, you know. If she needs anything, well, keep an eye on her, will you? Thanks. How much time have I got left? Is that all? You watch, you sure you watch? Okay. I just want to sit here a little bit and look around. Yeah. Funny, I... I've always had so much time. Now I've only got enough to sit here. It's a swell room. A good house. And a good life. Hey... Hearts and flowers. Okay, Dad, get the car out. I'm all ready to go. Ready to go. Ready to go where? Tom, if I only knew where you were. Or if you were. Elsa's room. The silly room I'd call it with its frippery, billowing curtains. Cretan flounces on the dressing table at which she'd sat so many times, covering with glamour a face that was so very young. Christ, Dad, come on in. Dad, do you think this makeup's too dark? My lipstick? No, I know it's red. It's the reddest I could get. Oh, Dad, this is a terrible thing to say, but I'm going to miss dressing up like this. Oh, that's silly. It's a beautiful uniform and a beautiful chance, and I want it. I miss all the frills. <laughs> if they heard me talk, they'd pull up the game plank before I got there. <laughs> Tomorrow? Six o'clock. Dad, uh, I'd rather you didn't come down to the station. No, no, it isn't that. I, I, I just don't want... Dad, please. Just the way you did when Tom... Just let me go along. Thank you, darling. Dad, I may not get another chance, so I'll say it again. Please, please don't forget to take the coffee pot off the stove every morning. If you burn the bottom out of it, I'll... All right, all right, I believe you. Then eat right, Dad. Vegetables. Please have at least one vegetable a day. And beer isn't a vegetable. <laughs> if I come back and find you as fat as Patty's pig, I'm going to... I'm going to... Oh, Dad, I wish I had another week. Even another day. Make sure you'll be all right. I think I've arranged everything about the meals and the laundry and about the cleaning. If I were only sure you'd be all right. Oh, I shouldn't talk like that. You'll be all right, and I'll be all right, and Tom is... All right. Hey, gosh, I'm late for my date. Turn out the light for me, will you, Dad? Everything as it had been. But now a place I couldn't stay in. To walk as I had done so many times before Until the circle of my aimless steps Brought me back to this empty house I lived in I had made the walk so many times Fifty steps and that silly little Pekingese of Mrs. Engelhart Would see me pass and yap at me Another dozen steps and the broken piece of sidewalk In front of the Andrews place 
Then the iron picket fence Tom used to run along when he was small, banging his stick along the iron pickets as he ran. So half the neighborhood knew his nibs was free of school for another day. I passed a big oak tree where Elsa would stand with her girlfriends when she was very young and giggle when the latest football hero passed. <laughs> laughter. Children's laughter. They'd laugh, too. They'd been full of laughter, my children. <laughs> oh, oh, no. Tom, this one. Look at this one. <laughs> Holy... Oh, wait a minute. Give me that. Oh, no. Hey, make her give it to me. Elsa, <laughs> Oh, no. This one goes to your commanding officer. Elsa, if you don't give me that picture... It's a museum. Oh, Tom, I'm coming around that table and break your neck. <laughs> Listen, Frank Star, I won't do you any good. I've got duplicates. No. Elsa, Dad, don't just stand there. Do something. Don't take any chances. I've got two dozen printed out. Oh, Dad, you shouldn't have given it up. He said you clean out the drawer, so I did. Oh, but Elsa... I'll mail it to Hap Arnold, and they'll paint it on the nose of your bum. Oh, my sister, you snake on the grass. <laughs> Pretty words won't get you anywhere. Please. This makes up for every time you paddled me. Elsa. Oh, Dad, this is the most wonderful going away mm -hmm. present. Elsa, dear. My beautiful, conceited brother at the age of three, riding naked on a white horse. Oh, oh brother. <laughs> my steps went past the children's laughter. The endless circle of my aimless steps. suddenly was there, walking alongside of me. Can I walk with you, Mr. Rogers? All right. I heard a funny joke today. A man was riding along and he got lost. You know, he didn't know where he was. And he went up to a farmer and he said to the farmer, where's the road to town? The farmer said, I don't know. And the fellow said, well, where's the road to the other town? The farmer said, I don't know. And the fellow said, well, where's the road to some other town? The farmer said, I don't know. And the fellow said, you don't know much, do you? And the farmer said, no, but I ain't lost. <laughs> funny joke, huh, Mr. Rogers? Yeah. Very funny. I got a new harmonica. Have you? Do you play the harmonica? No. I can. My ma said, please get out of the house if you're going to play that. I got a headache. What a headache, Mr. Rogers. Loud noises, unnecessary conversations, worry. You got worries, Mr. Rogers? What's that song you were playing? I mean, a moment ago. I don't know. You got worries, Mr. Rogers? Play your harmonica, son. Okay. say something to me. Yet was afraid to speak. And then he did speak. You, you take such big steps, Mr. Rogers. I'm sorry. That better? Yes. You going anywhere in particular, son? No, sir. No school today? Saturday. Oh, I forgot. You didn't know it was Saturday? Sometimes one day... It's to be like another. Mr. Rogers, listen, you must wait. Jimmy Doolittle go over with a thousand, thousand flying forts and he'll get Tom out. You just wait and see. Jimmy Doolittle get him away from those jabs. Honesty will. And then he was gone. I kept on walking. Then this thought. The boy, this neighbor boy, his meeting and walking with me had not been accidental. He had wanted to walk with me and say what he had said. A thousand, thousand flying fortresses, headed up by Superman, I suppose, with Tarzan of the Apes leading a charge of elephants toward my son's prison camp. Prison camp. I didn't even know if he was in a prison camp. Those devils. What have they done to my son? Good morning, Mr. Rogers. 
How are you this morning? I'm your neighbor, Mrs. Gibson. A woman. Yes, a neighbor. I'd seen her once or twice as I'd walk by. And now she was there walking with me, a grocery bag in her arm, and talking to me. Hard last night. Yes, it did. All the rain this spring has certainly done wonders for our lawns. I've noticed yours. It's very lovely. Yeah. Of course, the whole problem is to get someone to do the mowing. I saw you talking to little David Miller. I guess the smaller boys of this neighborhood will come into their own this year. What with the 12 and 14 year olds all going off to help on the farms during their vacations. If the grass grows tall, there will be no harm. No, of course. No. Did you hear about the Griffith boy? No. He was out flying a kite, and it fell across those high-tension wires over on Oak Street. And he and some of the other boys got a ladder and put it across the telephone and telegraph post. And they were halfway up when Mr. Griffith came along. The Griffith boy had a metal fishing rod that he was going to use to lift the kite off the wires. Can you imagine that? He'd have been electrocuted if Mr. Griffith hadn't just happened to leave work early that day. If you ever expect him to grow up, you certainly have to watch your children every minute. I mean... I'm sorry, I... I mean, uh, Mr. Rogers, I, I wonder if I could ask you something. Yeah? Well, I know your daughter Elsa has been overseas for a long time, but my daughter Peggy is joining us, and... And you can understand how excited I've been. I was wondering if you could tell me anything that would... You were saying... I was just finding an excuse to talk to you. Peggy is joined up and gone. And I've watched you walk by my house every day. And today I started off to market just at this time, just so that I could have an excuse to, to tell you that, that Mr. Gibson and I would like very much to have you come to dinner some night this week. No, don't say yes or no now. Just think about it. And whenever you'd like to come over, just let us know. Goodbye. She turned and went. I'd walked along the street morning after morning. Hundreds of mornings from the day after the news came that Tom wouldn't be back. And Elsa left the house to join up. Morning after morning, and all was it had been alone. And now this, a, a boy, a woman. Childish prattle, feminine dinner making. What was this today? that tune again, the one the boy had been playing, one of the houses along the street, a Negro woman singing as she swept the front porch. The house I live in, the friends that I have found, the folks beyond the railroad, and the people all around. The farmer on the worker, the sailor on the sea, the men who built this country, that's America to me, the house I live in, my neighbor's white and black the people who just came here are from generations back the town hall and the soapbox the torch of liberty a home for all God's children that's the miracle to me. The words of old Abe Lincoln. 
Lincoln of Jefferson and Payne of Franklin Delano Roosevelt and the tasks that still remain our little bridge at Concord where freedom's fight began our Gettysburg and Midway and the story The house I live in, the goodness everywhere, a land of wealth and beauty with enough for all to share, the house that we call freedom, the home of liberty, where the promise for Tomorrow, that's a miracle to me. The house I live in. The house I lived in was an empty house. It was Anne. My Tom's Anne. I said, that's a wonderful song. Hello, Anne. Hello. You going anywhere in particular? I was just walking. Mind if I walk with you? Of course not. I'm glad to see you. How have you been? Fine, Mr. Rogers. Fine. I haven't seen you for quite some time. Almost a year. Has it been that long? Yes, it has. I had no idea. Mother and I have wanted very much to see you. I'm sorry. I've been very busy. I know. Your war work. Yet surely you could have found some time to come visit us. I'm sorry. It's going well. What's going well? The war. Is it? Did you know it rained last night? Yes, I know. I opened my window and lay on the bed and watched it. It was a strange sort of rain. So soft and fine. It wasn't as if it was rain at all. When it began to get light, every drop seemed to be dancing as it fell. You didn't sleep? I... I was thinking... Mr. Rogers, we've missed you very much. Why didn't you come see us? I'm sorry, dear. I don't go out these days at all. I go down to the plant. I do everything I can. When I come home, I like to shut the door and be quite alone. I'm sure you understand. Yet each morning you come out of the house and walk the street. How do you know that? I've watched you. We all have. You're very lonely, Mr. Rogers. Yes, I am. I was, too. What? You heard from Tom. No, no, I didn't. Then the War Department, why should they write you? Why not me? Why didn't Mr. they... Mr. Rogers, please, there's been nothing. No letter. Then what? Tell me. I... I don't know how. I see. All right, that's natural. Why not? You've been away so long. Why shouldn't you find someone else? Oh, no, no, that's not it. Of course not. Why won't you understand? Understand what? You say you're not lonely anymore, and I'm supposed to understand. Understand what? That you're young, that you can forget. But can I forget my son? Can I forget what he said, how he looked, how he... What have I got left but a lonely house? I stopped being lonely the day someone... One of the neighborhood women stopped me on the street... Asked me where she and some of the others could send packages to Tom. Our Tom? Yes. Ours. 
I don't understand. Why should they... What was Tom to them? Tom mattered to a lot of people on this street. I suddenly began to realize that he mattered on many other streets where they didn't know his name or who he was. Why, Anne? Why? Because Tom isn't just ours anymore. What had happened to him mattered to everybody back home who has a sweetheart in this war. Or a husband. Or a son. that I lived in lost its wall and all the rooms were filled with rubble and the dust arose and when I looked again my empty house was gone and suddenly a new house arose and it was filled with people all the people to whom Tom mattered even though they had never seen him or didn't even know his name all the people whose hearts were filled with the work and the trouble and the hopes of this war that my son and my daughter, yes, yeah, and I, were fighting. So this is the house I live in, a house of people. And there can be no walls, but sorrow knows no walls. And determined knows no walls. And there are no walls for faith. heard Raymond Massey in The House I Live In, a new play by Arch Obler. Included in the cast with Mr. Massey were Anne Shepard, Alfred Ryder, Mercedes McCambridge, and Hester Sundergaard. The song, The House I Live In, was written by Earl Robinson and Lewis Allen and was sung by Miss Hope Foy. The original music was set by Gordon Jenkins and the orchestra was conducted by Sylvan Levin. <laughs> Next week, from Hollywood, Mr. Obler will bring you an original comedy entitled Love, 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 which is subtitled An Excursion into the Gentle Art. This will be the fourth in a special series of plays written, produced, and directed for the Mutual Broadcasting System by Arch Obler. To conclude the program, Sylvan Levin and the orchestra bring you excerpts from Gordon Jenkins' original tone poem, This Living Book, dedicated to the free men of the free nations who are now meeting in San Francisco to plan a free tomorrow. This is the Mutual Broadcasting System.